thanks for coming, and um, I hope you feel this is worthwhile. As, as Anne says, this is very much an, an outgrowth of a kind of research I've been doing for a few years now um, ar around the BBC's presentation of science going right back to the early days. And you can, as with many research projects, you can slice this in many ways. Uh, we can slice this up as seeing it as part of the history of science popularisation, engagement, that kind of thing. Um, and you can also slice it up as part of media history. There's media historians have an interest in broadcasting, newspapers, all those kinds of things. Um, but particularly public service broadcasting and how that got going, because it is such a, a strange enterprise. And the more public service broadcasting becomes threatened, uh, the more it seems a remarkable enterprise to me. And historians of, of, of media have concentrated a lot of attention on the BBC. So this kind of fits into that as well. And I have been fortunate to be able to publish in both areas, in media history and in science popularisation. Now, the title, of course, is uh, tendentious. Uh, it's dangerous to claim any kind of first. I, I don't doubt there was something before this that tried to engage um, the early listening audience in the way this did, but this is the first I know of anyway, which uh, perhaps gives me justification. What I'm concerned with is a series of science broadcasts in 1931 called Science in the Making. Actually, two series, because there was a, a second one, which I'll get to in due course. But this was 1931, so basically about 10 years after broadcasting started in this country. And there was plenty of other science broadcasting going on. I wouldn't want you to think this was the sum total. In 1931, there would have been a lot more going on. But it would be more conventional delivery of scientific experts. These attempted to get listeners engaged by sending in their own responses and findings. Now, there's a job of detection to go on here because there are no audio recordings of any of these broadcasts. What, whatever I say about these has had to be pieced together from all over the place, and I wouldn't pretend to have the complete story. Um, uh, more significantly, I, I wouldn't pretend to have the complete understanding of what the significance of this series of broadcasts was, um, but I might be able to give some pointers. Now, in 1931, as I say, um, broadcasting had been happening for around 10 years. Um, by my, from my consultations, the number of UK licence holders around there was 4 million. You couldn't operate a radio set legally and listen to the BBC without a licence. It's a rather idiosyncratic way of doing broadcasting, but it does give us a very good handle on statistics. 4 million licences which was reckoned to be about 35 households out of 100, every 100, on it, taking the UK as a whole, had licences, which I think is not bad, considering it's only been going for 10 years. We, we always flatter ourselves that everything so, happens so much faster in our society, in our culture, than in the past. But repeatedly, when you look back into old introductions of old technologies, railways, canals, broadcasting, the astonishing thing to me, at any rate, is how fast they happened. Um, anyway, here's the first series. None of these people are really big names. You perhaps recognise Lancelot Hogburn, uh, famous in his day and somewhat subsequently populariser of science and maths. His broadcast was quite different because he didn't actually ask the listeners to do anything. He just spoke about his view of science. It's the other five that required... Um, people to do things. And I'll try and I'll go through them, each one, each one, and tell you what happened. Um, I think these names are more or less forgotten. Charles Seligman, still known in anthropological circles. So I'll try and fill in a bit of background, not just about what these broadcasters wanted listeners to do, but also who they were and, and what listeners actually did. So we'll start with John R. Baker, um, biologist, and, and a fascinating PhD for somebody. Uh, I'll come, perhaps come to that. Um, he was interested in what it is that determines the start of the breeding season of birds in the UK. Um, he felt that people didn't understand what it was that um, 
initiated breeding, egg-laying birds. So he thought he would engage listeners. And he chose the blackbird, not because he was particularly interested in the blackbird, but just because he was confident that everybody would be able to recognize the blackbird. And also it's ubiquitous. It's in towns, it's in suburbs, it's in the countryside. So it's all over the place. So it seemed to him a good bird to use. And he spoke in his broadcast, which we don't have, but we can deduce that he spoke about breeding seasons, birds, and this sort of thing. Then at the end of the broadcast, he invited listeners to find a nest near them and uh, in the early spring to start observing the nest, preferably every day. And then when they see the first egg, let him know. So uh, what he wanted was the name and address of the observer, place where the eggs were observed, actual date of laying, if known. He, he was aware that people couldn't possibly go every day, so there might have to be some interpolation if you go two days later after your last visit and find two eggs there, then you make a deduction that one was from the day before. Actual date of hatching, uh, and then send this information to him at Oxford. And he had a very, what I would say is not a huge response, considering that there are four million households with licenses. He had about 770 usable responses which he plotted because he was interested in a geographical distribution of the start of the breeding season. And he finds that it starts here, down in the southwest, about a month earlier than up here um, in the no northeast. And um, he's grateful naturally to have this information. But I think what makes this broadcast in many ways the most satisfactory uh, of all of these is the follow-up because he, did, he gave a broadcast a year later about this in which he explains what he's done with these results and that seems to me where the science comes in actually it's not in inviting people to send in their responses it's in explaining to them what he does with their responses and the subsequent broadcast fortunately was printed in the listener so we do know what he said he says well Everything starts earlier here than here. Flowers start earlier. So the obvious assumption is something to do with temperature. It's the average temperature here. And then he proceeds to show you that there are good reasons for discounting that, that as an explanation. He points out that research is happening with other animals, not just birds, uh, 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 looking at the effect of temperature on the start of the breeding season. And he's finding that temperature doesn't seem to be doing much there. He points out that uh, the breeding season starts around mid to late March, generally down here. But sometimes the temperature in February is milder than the temperature in March, somewhat um, counterintuitively, but, but we know that's true. But he said that, does, that doesn't seem to affect, from his own observations, the start of the breeding season. A, a, a mild February doesn't seem to make birds start breeding earlier. So he thinks there's something else that accounts for it. What, what could it be? Um, he comes to this conclusion. I think the only reasonable explanation is this. Before the equinox, that's 21st of March, the southern birds had longer periods of daily exposure to light than the Scottish birds. It must be the longer delay before the equinox that caused the southern birds to breed sooner. Um, the actual breeding at the time of the equinox was probably preceded by a fairly long period during which the reproductive organs were gradually growing. So that's his scientific conclusion, if you like. He's decided it's uh, the length of time exposure to sunlight before the equinox. Which, um, in the south of England, you would have more daylight before the equinox. And he produced a scientific paper, co-wrote with his sister, Ina, Baker. And, uh, it, you know, this is just the opening. It goes on for several pages. But he does acknowledge in his opening sentence that um, one of us broadcast a talk in the national programme, that was, if you like, the forerunner of Radio 4, in which listeners were asked to record the date of laying of the first eggs and, and so on. And I'll just show you a few more pages from his report. Well, I don't, I'm not a biologist, I don't know what the status of this is, whether it's been shown to be um, not valid, or whether something else um, is more important. But it seems to me you actually see this 
way of doing things at its best. Uh, you get the information from the listeners, you do something with it, you follow it up explaining why you've come to the conclusion you've, you've come to. And that's where the science is, as I said. And you, you actually even have um, a publication. You know, um, If only they'd stopped there. The next one uh, is Ivan, I think this is pronounced Magari. Um, and he, he was like something of, like, of a throwback to the 19th century gentleman scientist. He didn't ever have an academic position. He had um, private income. He inherited property and um, income. So perhaps it would be unduly pejorative to say that science was a hobby, but he, he didn't depend on it. And he interested in himself in all kinds of things. Archaeology, uh, the weather, natural history and published books on these things. But I don't think at the time he would have claimed, or anyone would have claimed, that he was at the forefront of scientific research. But once again, he's interested in uh, the effect of weather now, not daylight, on uh, the flowering of plants. So he, if you like, he's kind of assumed that this is the relevant factor. Uh, and so he wants people to observe um, one of the most common hedgerow shrubs, the blackthorn, so he's assuming people can ad identify this, um, and to report to him when it starts to flower. So he wants the name and address of the observers. This is interesting. Distance and direction of observation from the nearest railway station. That's uh, fascinating to think that once upon a time you could assume everybody lived near a functioning railway station. Date of opening of the first flowers, um, height above sea level. Uh, what became of this, I don't know. Um, he, didn't, uh, he didn't really publish anything apart from some books, as I said. He didn't publish in journals. Um, the only clue I've got to what became of this is uh, a little note tucked away in the following year's BBC handbook. This is um, an annual publication, or it was an annual publication. And tucked away in there, you find all kinds of interesting things. Um, the Royal Meteorological Society, of which Margari was a member, is in the habit of undertaking a scheme of annual observations on the times of flowering and fruiting of certain plants and the dates of appearance and disappearance of certain migrants, etc. Mr. Margari spoke of the Society's work in this field and asked for a special investigation to be undertaken into the time of the first flowering of the black, the black thorn. As an immediate result of his talk, over 250 people offered their services as recorders for the Society's own scheme. Um, the results of the Blackthorn experiment were in complete agreement with the Society's own data. So what looks a bit strange there is this, this broadcast is, if you like, not so much a scientific in investigation as an invitation to the listeners to confirm what people like Margari already knew or already believed. Um, so I, I, one would have to say this is kind of, you know, not, not the most adventurous use of the medium. And there was no follow-up broadcast explaining what had happened. We assume, therefore, that as the society was in the habit of collecting this data, that the data from the BBC listeners was stirred in, into everybody else's data and it became part of their, if you like, their data bank. So moving on to... A.D. Middleton, whose first name I don't know, um, Census Returns for Animals. As with all these broadcasts, the title doesn't really give you much of a clue as to what it's all about. Middleton was very interested in the progression of the grey squirrel, which was introduced into Britain in the 19th century, and was advancing from various parts of the country where it had been introduced or released, and displacing the red squirrel, as, as we know. And during the 1930s, every couple of years or so, he would publish an article in one of the uh, appropriate journals and a map showing the spread of the grey squirrel. And it was not clear at that time, though, that the grey squirrel would, as we now know, pretty well completely displace the red squirrel. He envisaged perhaps some kind of coexistence. So that was why he was interested in tracking this, as far as I, was con as far as I can tell. Um, so he asks for people's observations on uh, grey squirrels and red squirrels, whether the red squirrels have decreased. But there's nothing quantitative in, in there. He asks for approximate 
dates and things. Um, and once again, there's no follow-up broadcast, so if you like, the, the opportunity to expose the real science here, it, it kind of um, went by default. Here's a sample of the type of article he, he produced every couple of years about the progression of the, the grey squirrel. And the information for these came from all over the place. He put it, appeals in newspapers, um, friends, colleagues, other societies, BBC farming programmes, he would ask people to send in their observations. So this particular broadcast I've been talking about is just provided him, with, as far as I can see, with just further information to put in with all the others he was getting uh, to chart the progression of the grey squirrel in the UK. And this is one of his maps. Um, the, I think these are the areas where the, the grey squirrel is, is expanding because it had been re released in several places. Um, so, again, in terms of scientific engagement, you have perhaps um, an interesting idea, but not much in the way of follow-up to actually make it, as far as the listeners are concerned, a, a, a project really to get your teeth into. You'll notice also that everything I've spoken about here is natural history. It's the kind of thing where I suppose it's a reasonable assumption that, that there are people out there with enough knowledge to be able to make this worthwhile, enough knowledge to give reliable data, uh, that sort of thing. But the next one has nothing to do with natural history. It's this, the, the most obscure character of, of any of these. I'll call him John Shaxby, but I have a feeling that's pronounced John Sheesby, actually. And his broadcast was not really about when sound becomes noise at all. It's about the, the phenomenon of masking, auditory masking. And I, I'll play you what I th think is um, an almost plausible reconstruction of what, what he was involved, what was involved. But he, he spoke about the phenomenon of masking, which is where one sound can make a simultaneous sound apparently inaudible. So a loud sound naturally makes a simultaneous quieter sound inaudible. Well, not inevitably. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. That's part of the uh, interest of auditory masking. It's sort of to do with relative frequencies uh, as well as relative amplitudes and that kind of thing. So he spoke about this and then he played various tones which were going to demonstrate this phenomenon. Or rather, he was going to ask people to send in their observations and from this, you know, he would be able to establish thresholds of masking. So um, I'll give you a little bit of what's going on here and then ex try to explain it. Um, come on. It's the thousand hertz. So you've got the high pitched tone, thousand hertz, this one 495. And you can see what's going to happen. You're going to get pairs. This one's going to get quieter, and this one will get louder. So the idea is that at some point, this increasingly loud sound will mask this one. So at some point in this progression, these are all heard together simultaneously. You will stop hearing this, we think. So the question he wants to know is, when do you stop hearing it? So he invites listeners to start counting when you get the two together. And when you can no longer hear this one, you stop counting and that's your score, and you send it in. So, let's, let's try that. Um, I'll, I'll play it from the beginning so you can attune yourself to the 1000 hertz, because the question is, when do you stop hearing that 1000 hertz? Well, there you go. Um, so 
so you, you do the counting, you send it in. But it was a bit more sophisticated than this, certainly a bit more complicated. Instead of this 15 or 16 tones here, you, pairs of tones you've got here, you had 42. Okay. And instead of just 1,000 against 495, you had 1,000 with 495. You also had 615 hertz against 495, closing the gap. And you had 760 hertz against 495. Uh, so you, you do this counting of potentially up to 42 to tones three times. So um, if you're interested in the, the kind of the reliability of the methodology here, I think you have to allow for the possibility that people get lose count, get confused, and so on. Um, I, I've thought about this quite a bit, and I don't know what conclusion to come to. One, one thing that seems to me is, once you get going, you can sort of anticipate what's going to come next, and you can perhaps convince yourself that you're hearing something. You know, well, perhaps you're not. So maybe methodolo methodologically, instead of this smooth progression, what you should do is jumble them up, you see. Um, but then the trouble with, that, with doing that would be that counting them doesn't allow you to home in on the threshold so well. So there may have been some other methodological sophistication, but as far as I know, it's the counting. And um, again, there was no follow-up to this, but Shaxby did in his broadcast talk that preceded the tones, explain a bit of, of the current thinking at the time. The old belief was that a low-pitched sound, so if you like the, the 495 down here, could completely mask a higher-pitched one, the 1000, but that a high note, though it could disturb our hearing, could never obliterate the lower one. So that upper one, upper one apparently couldn't mask the lower one. Um, recent work in the Bell Telephone Company's laboratories has shown that these older views need serious modification. The general facts which emerge are these. A masking tone interferes very little with much lower notes, even if it itself is loud. It causes the maximum trouble, as one might expect, with notes of nearly its own pitch, and it masks high notes only if it is itself powerful, when it may entirely drown them out. So he is, in a sense, operating at the at cutting edge of auditory perceptual research, um, but it, he is sort of looking for confirmation of uh, this work that's going on at the Bell Telephone Laboratories. Now, I've asked colleagues who are in the business of acoustics whether they know anything about John Shaxby. They've never heard of him. They don't know um, who he was. He does, doesn't appear to have published anything uh, in connection with this. What I do know is that he was operating at this time at Cardiff University, or it might have been Cardiff University College. And he, during the 30s, he was also instrumental in the setting up of those, what are, have been called acoustic radars, those big um, horns on the south coast for detecting the uh, sound of uh, aircraft coming towards Britain. He's part of that project. Apart from that, um, I know virtually nothing about him or what, if anything, came of this information. So now we come to Charles Seligman, who was, of, of, these, academ of these scientists, probably the most distinguished at the time, Professor Charles Seligman, as he was, at, um, at the, I think he was at the London School of Economics, I'm not sure about that, but um, si uh, certainly a significant anthropologist, um, in his day. Um, curiously, we might wonder now whether this is actually, we would actually count this as science, but presumably then it, it, it kind of passed muster. And it's this business about dreaming. As, as an anthropologist, Seligman had been, was very interested in different cultures, or as he, as, as pops up repeatedly, different races. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised about this, but it comes as a shock to me how often this term race is banded around in the literature of this period as, as a meaningful term, as a meaningful way of distinguishing people. Um, anyway, he says, it's my purpose now to consider dreams from the standpoint of the anthropologist to show how certain dreams, which may be called type dreams, occur in every people no matter what their cultural condition or the race to which they belong, and to ask you, my listeners, to assist me in the study of these dreams by writing and letting me know whether 
any of you have had any of these type dreams. So a type dream is a, is a recurring um, form of dream, a re recurring narrative. And he says, certain dreams recur so frequently, these type dreams, in so many subjects of all races, yet again, with the same meaning attached to them, um, that they may fairly be termed type dreams. Such dreams are those of flying, the loss of a tooth or teeth. Uh, to put it briefly, the identical symbolism, that is, identical symbols with the same meaning attached to them, found in the dreams of unrelated races, differing profoundly in their civilization and social organization, can only signify that the unconscious of all these races is qualitatively much the same. That gets to the nub of what he's interested in. You can see it's, it's some kind of outgrowth of Freud and Jung, the idea that there is some, a deep level, um, there is some kind of commonality, and that different races, as he says, uh, it's not just that we have all the same dreams, but the meanings attached to them in these cultures are the same. This is, must be tapping down into some kind of deep, pervasive thing in the uh, human psyche uh, across all cultures and presumably all times. And these are his three type dreams that he wants people to report on. Tooth loss, which in, apparently in all cultures signifies loss of a near and dear friend and relative. Raw meat, one I've never had, but I've been troubled with ever since reading this, um, signifies misfortune, flying good fortune. So he um, invited people to, to write in about these dreams. And fortunately, some of the correspondence he got from listeners survives at the uh, Royal Anthropological Institute in London. I've taken a look at it. And, um, well, you know the old adage, ne never invite people to, to talk about their dreams. When, when you start reading these letters, you, you think, oh, blimey, you know, these people are just wittering on and on about their dreams. Uh, but he, he, he may well have found something useful in this for his research. On the other hand, once again, it may only have been confirming work he'd already done. Because 10 years before this broadcast, he put an appeal into a journal um, inviting people, guess what, to tell him about their type dreams. And he listed six, the, these three and three others. So he got information from there. And something else uh, as, as well, other events, he would ask people to report their um, type dreams. So this was an ongoing project. It wasn't just dreamt up for this BBC broadcast. And um, I assume that whatever results he got from this, he mixed them in with his others as part of his, uh, his project of, of talking about the significance of these dreams. It probably came to an abrupt end because he died relatively young. I think it was about 1940, 40, 41. Um, and he had other anthropological interests as well. So it's not clear really what part this broadcast played in his thinking, it seems pretty clear that his thinking was already well advanced on this l line of research before the broadcast. So that gives us, brings us pretty much to the end of that first series, where I think you've got um, a palpable hit with the John Baker, the Blackbirds ones, um, an interesting project that has real science, engages listeners, has the follow-up, and uh, does, does the trick quite neatly. The others, you kind of feel, haven't really been thought out um, well enough in terms of what, what it's doing for the listeners. It might be doing quite a lot for the broadcasters because they're getting extra data which they can make use of, but what's it doing for the listeners? There was a second series, which I'll come to, but we'll have a bit of an interlude now while I talk to you about adult education. See, what all these broadcasts were part of the BBC's adult education stream, and this is the, the context in which we want to see them. Now, everybody knows this thing, the BBC, about inform, educate and entertain, but what we perhaps don't appreciate so much is how much this educate bit was actually locked into the broadcasting structure in a very fundamental way. So uh, from, let's say, 1928, when things really got going in this field, adult education, I mean, um, through to 35, 36, when it all started to fall apart, the evening schedule was dominated by broadcasts that were part of the adult education stream. And the year was divided into three terms, like a, an academic term. So here we've got the term 
April to July 1930. We've got the days of the week, uh, various times of the day, 7 o'clock, so we're talking about prime time stuff here, 7.25, 8 o'clock. All these broadcasts in these boxes here are part of the adult education stream. What that means is that um, ideally you would be following these broadcasts seriously. They were meant to be intelligible and enjoyable to the general listener, but for serious listening, for serious study, what you would do is you would get supplementary material from BBC which would have reading lists, synopses of the broadcast, because you know, the, each of these would be a series of like 12, 12 broadcasts, if you like, in that slot through the course of the year. You would be encouraged to listen in um, a study group, so get together with people in your area, listen to the broadcast at the same time in, a, say, a church hall, something like that, in the presence of uh, an education officer or a tutor, something like that, and discuss the pro broadcast afterwards. And there would be questions for discussion afterwards. And we've got all kinds of subjects here. We've got um, readings from Victorian poets. Cyril Burt, um, now discredited figure, did an awful lot of um, psychological type broadcasting there. Um, German, something here on architecture. Victorian poets, industrial archaeology, James Agate, significant literary figure, talking about plays. Ernest Newman, significant musicologist, doing uh, musical talks. So a significant part of the broadcasting schedule was given over to this adult education project. And these science in the, broad, in the making broadcasts all fit into this pattern. And the leading light in terms of production of, well, certainly the science broadcasts and some others, was Mary Adams, uh, who joined the BBC in 1930. She was herself a, a biologist, and then left the BBC, left the radio wireless when things started to go sour around 1935-36. And one of her colleagues said, uh, Mary Adams raised high the level of broadcast science talks through her contacts with scientists at the universities and her ability to pick out the latest scientific developments and have them presented in a lively, informative way. When she transferred to television in 1936, the light she had lit in the talks department uh, grew dim again. And I think in, in these um, enterprising broadcasts that the um, Richard uh, Lambert, editor of The Listener, is singling out, I think we can include the Science in the Making series as part of these ingenious things that she tried. Um, we shouldn't overlook the fact that people were trying to invent broadcasting, find out what you do with broadcasting. It wasn't a given how you, how you use this new medium. People were trying all kinds of different ways. And Mary Adams particularly disliked getting in big, na big name scientists just to spout their knowledge. She thought that was pretty dreary and so she was all the time looking for new and interesting ways to uh, present science on, on radio and subsequently television. Um, David Attenborough was her most famous protege in the television world when she moved over there. Now the first series was in spring 1931. Uh, during 1931 Mary Adams had this idea of bringing all these educational broadcasts for two terms under one umbrella theme. And what she wanted to talk about, or what she wanted her broadcasters to talk about, was to address themselves to the question of what it is that makes society change, what makes things alter uh, as society, you know, as time passes. What, what are the forces at work making society modify itself and change? So she had this idea that there would be a big enterprise called The Changing World, and uh, oh, we'll come to that in a moment. Uh, the Changing World, so science broadcasts, economics, literature, art, they would all be thinking in their different ways about the forces of change in society. And this was going to operate from the autumn of 1931 through to the spring 1932. But while she was planning this series of broadcasts, other things were happening in the British economy, and uh, there'll be people here who know more about this than I do, but the, the, the stock exchange crash in New York in 1929 sent out ripples all over the place. 
And over the next couple of years, economies in other countries started to shake. And in Britain and other countries, the value of the pound was tied to gold. It was tied, so for every pound, there was an equivalent amount of gold somewhere in the treasury. And as we all know, economics is all about confidence. And people started to lose confidence in this uh, in the pound note, they would rather have the gold, and the, the gold started to disappear out of the... I don't pretend to understand economics, but for a time, things looked desperate because there wasn't enough gold held in stock to back up this paper currency that everybody was using. And um, it had political ramifications. It meant that uh, Britain could no longer get money or borrow money uh, on a short-term basis and that kind of thing. And for a time, and this was during the uh, Ramsay MacDonald Labour government, which had been elected on uh, a manifesto of more social welfare and that kind of thing, was in a pile of state and needed to borrow money just to keep the whole country afloat. Um, economists say that the, the country was just a few weeks away from economic collapse. And in order to borrow money to keep things going, um, Ramsay MacDonald and his cabinet had to abandon all these social welfare plans. And then you've got the collapse of the government and the coalition that came in and governed for much of the 1930s. So this economic crisis became part of Mary Adams's project of the changing world. And in fact, the purpose of this series of broadcasts changed from the forces of change to how do we cope with this calamity that now presents us. So she has this big series called The Changing World, with all, which is going to cover all ad adult education, going to be part of this. And in the brochure that goes with this, she says, for some time past, a sense of crisis has been abroad, which has led many to wonder what can be the outcome of our present troubles. This perplexity goes to the very roots of life and affects us not only in the economic and social sphere, but it's all per pervasive, setting its seal on art, literature, all expressions of the human spirit. It is quite plain that everyone is concerned about the future and is searching anxiously at once for new knowledge and a proper understanding of their present state and for the means of solution to their difficulties. And she's not exaggerating here, because the historian Arnold Toynbee has said that there was a pervasive feeling at this time that basically Western civilization, as we knew it, was in danger of collapsing. So this is the Changing World series. Everything is brought under this umbrella. It's to do with the current crisis. Um, we've got a sort of a philosophical strand, some big names here, T.S. Eliot, uh, John McMurray, a, a kind of ethical philosopher. It is said that his writings were very influential on the thinking of Tony Blair. Um, industry and trade, economists, literature and art, science, and then tucked in over here in the science strand. Each of these consists of 24 broadcasts. You know, 24 on that, 24 there. So you've got six of them. So it's 144 broadcasts, or about 72 hours if you broadcast it continuously. So it's a huge project. And here is William Beveridge, Science in the Making, Series 2, Changes in Family Life, William Beveridge, and others, six talks. Um, what you've got there is actually the residue of that old conception of this series as uh, looking at the forces of change. So actually, these talks, which were all published in a book, aren't really about the economic crisis of, at all, whereas several of the others are. It's really about what is it that's making uh, family life change, by which he means family size, um, dates of marriage, uh, educational uh, advancement of, of children relative to their parents, that kind of thing. So it's social science, basically, he's concerned with. And at this time, he was head of um, a department at London School of Economics. I think it was called Social Biology. So he gave his broadcasts talking about different aspects of, of social life, and then, towards the end, invited listeners to complete a questionnaire. And this is like where the engagement thing comes, comes in. So the questionnaire asked people to fill in information about their family, family circumstances, income. And this was quite controversial. It was a big questionnaire. It was seven pages long. 
and many of the newspapers of the time thought it was being unduly intrusive into people's personal circumstances. Um, it caused a bit of embarrassment for the BBC, uh, whose enemies then were pretty much the same as they are now, uh, and people wanted you know, any stick to beat the BBC with, if you like. Um, Anyway, that's a bit more of Mary Adams saying what this series is being is trying to do is face up squarely to the present situation and provide a survey of the many changes in outward circumstances and the evolution of thought and values which have brought into being the world as it is today. So the beverage series it kind of doesn't really quite fit that. But here are some of the questions from his, his questionnaire. Um, which income bracket are you in? Um, year and month of marriage, education, age of completing education, place, um, age of le leaving parents' home, and so on. Are you, uh, are you separated? Give month and year of separation. Um, occupation. How did you meet your wife or husband? And uh, at the time of this, he said, nearly all the London papers were either critical or contemptuous of the scheme. The provincial press, as it is called, was more divided and gave some cases strong and reasoned support, while the London papers pub uh, gave publicity by opposition. So the London papers opposed this thing. So he had 8,000. Those in things in series one were just in the hundreds. This is 8,000 returns, covering 20,000 families, um, so he's got all this data and he says, and there was a follow-up broadcast for this, that this is going to be an invaluable resource for social science and that people will be studying this for a long time. He says that data has been amassed at the London School of Economics. You go down there, they don't know anything about it. It's not there, it doesn't survive. Um, what became of all this? He did give this follow-up broadcast based on as he said, a survey of 500 of these returns. And what he finds there is the birth rate has declined relative to that of previous generations. Men tended to go into their father's trade more so than women. Women occupied a narrower range of professions than men, but wider than that of previous generations of women. Family ties were becoming looser, but were still significant. The trouble is, none of that was new. People knew this at the time. In fact, in the broadcast that he preceded this survey, he'd said pretty much these kinds of things. So it's quite questionable whether he was actually getting anything from this. And also, uh, it's very hard to generalize, what, to make it justifiable generalizations. Beveridge says, nearly all the forms I have read, whether coming from husbands or wives, confirm that economic dependence of the wife in marriage today is hardly ever mentioned as a grievance or a difficulty. But none of the questions actually asked whether you had any grievances. So this is some kind of inferation, in, um, some kind of deduction from the fact that people chose not to mention this as a grievance. They were not asked about it specifically. So how representative of that is that of the, of the general population? I just don't know, really. Um, the, those, sur those surveys were not kind of statistically uh, grounded. Multiple reporting. The questionnaire asks you not just about your immediate family but brothers and sisters. So if all members of one generation of a family completed the form you'd have multiple responses referring to the same set of people. So there's kind of a methodological issue there if you're going to try and make this survey quantitative. Um, and then the lack of novel findings. As I said most of these things he singled out for comment were common knowledge in, in the social sciences profession. In fact, his own colleagues at the London School of Economics, people like, well, like Lancelot Hogben, were doing, if you like, uh, far more detailed, statistically grounded surveys of changes in family life, where they really sampled their uh, populations in such a way that you could make numerical conclusions. And in fact, one of the books published by Lancelot Hogben and his colleagues um, really puts this kind of work in the shade. So you start to wonder, well, what was the scientific value of this? But 
it engaged with 8,000 people or 8,000 families who saw fit to respond. So, uh, you know, maybe just inviting people to talk about themselves always produces um, a good response. Uh, Mary Adams, summing up these, uh, these series, uh, spoke about the two, the two, change, uh, two sciences in the making series. Um, the method has also been applied to sociological problems, e.g. in the famous and elaborate questionnaire on the family sent out by Sir William Beveridge. 12,000 replies. Hmm? I was underestimating, received, uh, and the results were tabulated at the London School of Economics, where they are available for research students. Well, I don't know. I just think, I think they must have been binned. Mary Adams says, uh, this is Mary Adams, the last one wasn't, the experiments we have tried in securing the cooperation of listeners uh, in making appropriate observations have been, I think, fairly successful. Science in the Making was one series of that kind um, in two contributions at any rate, Results of real value were got. John Baker, that, the Blackbirds won. And this is curious, this one, the one on sound. She thinks those two produced real uh, science uh, as, as part of a spin-off. Beveridge's family forum was an attempt to get information on social matters for objective analysis. This questionnaire method involves trouble and expense. It certainly did when you look at the paperwork, the drafting and redrafting of this questionnaire, and the disputes between the BBC and the London School of Economics who was going to pay for all this stuff, uh, and also the notoriety in the press. You can see she's getting a bit nervous about this. Um, these talks are of value because they show methodology. So that, that's, I think, the crux of it. If you do it well, it shows people how scientists work. And as a spin-off, you might actually get some useful science out of it. But primarily, it's this one. It's an exposure to the way scientists think. And I think that's probably, that's pretty much it. Um, in this kind of context, perhaps uh, what the bigger issue is, well, what does it always tell us about this way of doing engagement? As far as I know, I know there are no further series of this kind. But then that whole adult education system kind of collapsed around 1935-36. And... Uh, in the new style of broadcasting that came in, this kind of thing might not have been appropriate uh, anyway. Um, but I think it's a continuing battle in, in the media and in public service, is, is what your relationship to your audience is. Are they passive consumers? Are they critics? Are they colleagues with whom you engage? And I think this is a, a never-ending issue, really, and uh, it has a history. You know, we think of so much of what happens now as particularly to our age, but you find all these things have a history, and this is part of this history of this kind of scientific engagement. So, thanks for listening. I assume we have to take a few questions. Has it's up to you. you don't <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Can I go first? Yeah, go. I was kind of curious about the um, like the way that the first series was put together, mm. and whether you could tell us anything more about it. You know, how did they yeah. pitch this as an idea? How did they convince mm. you know the people who were putting together that education program that this would be a valuable contribution? Well, I don't. I I, I can't pretend I know. I can speculate. Um, Mary Adams was quite an influential figure. Um, and I think it, it, even this institution that we're members of, you, uh, what I have seen over the, over the years, the way power moves from people who actually kind of engage at the, the ground level up to people who have to be convinced. And the BBC was still a young institution. Uh, she was influential. She was, her brief, as far as I can tell, was to do something with science broadcasting. So I would imagine most of her managers would, be say, would say, give it a shot. I imagine also that 20 or 30 years on, it would have been a different story. There's, I think there's also a lot of chance uh, going on here. John Baker was a broadcaster she'd used a lot, and she was very impressed with his broadcasting ability. So I could envisage her having a, 
a chat with him saying, I'm, I'm vaguely thinking of doing this, and he'd say, yeah, I can do something like that. Middleton had just produced another report on the grey squirrels, so if she'd been, she or her colleagues had been keeping an eye on the literature, they, they, they would have seen that. Um, Shaxby and his sound, I don't know. I suspect there's a Cardiff connection because Mary Adams herself had, been, uh, had done her first degree at Cardiff, where he was, you see. Um, and Seligman, he'd given other broadcasts as well. Um, you, when you look at these, all these broadcasts, you find there's a, a sort of a repertory company of favourite broadcasters, so Mary Adams would try them out. Uh, well, all producers, not just, not just Mary Adams. And if they thought they were good and audiences seemed to like, no, just use them to death until people got fed up with them. Right? Try and bring in somebody else. Um, but I, I don't know, <laughs> to answer your question. Uh, but, well, with the beverage, though, um, again, he had been giving broadcasts before this. He'd been a, a new, new boy on the BBC a few years from this. And the documents... The memos say, well, we thought he, he was pretty good in the BBC. We thought he was pretty good. You know, what, what can we use him for again? Um, so, again, I, I envisage some kind of conversation and them saying, well, you know, have you got any ideas? We're thinking of doing this. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, I can do this. But who knows? Um, that was absolutely fascinating. A um, couple of questions. The BBC had set up listening panels. Um, have they? Uh, or have they not started by that time? I don't think they had them. You, know, you, you must know Robert Sylvie's book. Uh, yeah, on, I can't remember when they started. Well, it's, the serious audience research starts about 1940-ish, really. Um, prior to that, feedback was basically unsolicited listeners, uh, listeners' letters and things. Letters. For which, as Robert Sylvie pointed out, this is fatal because people would just pick and choose, um, you know, the responses that they wanted. And Reith was very opposed to having any Yes, yes. yes. Okay, so, so the moment on this panel, what about mass observation? Didn't that start at the same time? Yes, I, I don't, yes. That, that, is the, that is the one to, to try out. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I have no idea what's, what the mass... The, the beverage report and mass observation seem, there's quite a lot of overlap there. It's a shame that you weren't yeah. able to find those records or that they've been lost. Yes. Because I know the mass observation archives at Sussex now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the standard work on beverage is by uh, uh, a now retired Professor Jose Harris from Oxford. I did have a little bit of correspondence with her, and she did say the trouble with beverage was that his strength actually wasn't in academic thinking. It was all, it's more t to do with, well, you know, social justice and the kinds of things we remember him from. And he, her feeling was that he really didn't quite make the grade as an academic, although he, you know, he tried. Um, and so when, when I mentioned this project, it didn't really seem to go off at, you know, full tilt. Um, she did kind of indicate that she thought she it wasn't she wasn't really surprised because she kind of didn't really th think about it in that kind of way. And also in the design of that questionnaire, there is there is any amount of correspondence about the design of that questionnaire at the archives at London School of Economics. And on the panel that devised it, you didn't just have William Bev Beveridge; you had um, Lancelot Hogburn, who. Um, is, is it not just uh, famous for being a, a popularizer, but he is a pioneer of stati statistical methods. And he wanted the survey to be statistically grounded, by which I think he must have meant, well, we need to get, a, we need to represent society as a whole in our sample. So the right number of working class, middle class, this, ink, this. So you've got a representative sample. And he was talked down by Beveridge and said, no, we just invite people to respond to the questionnaire. And at that point, um, Hogburn just kind of seems to melt away, as though he thought, well, what's the point of that? If, if, you, if, if the body of responses you get is not in some way representative of the population of a whole, all you can ever say is that 10% of our responses said this, and 20% said that, but 
it doesn't really tell you anything about society as a whole. Um, so, uh, I don't, I've forgotten what the question was. <laughs> uh, so it was just about that sort of rise of scientific sociology. And yes. Like, you know, using data to... Yeah. Uh, well, as I mentioned, there, there was this big, big book published about 1939 by the department at the London School of Economics called, it's called Political Arithmetic, and the title um, apparently mirrors some kind of classic text from a couple of separations, a couple of centuries ago. And it's a, a grand compendium of the work that had been going on in scientific sociology in the 30s at this department at London School of Economics. So if there's anywhere where you'd expect to see this data used, it's in there. Well, this book is you know, that thick. I've been right through it. I won't claim to have read every word of it, but there's nothing of any of this. But what there is, is very sophisticated statistical discussions and examinations of all kinds of, of these kinds of things, birth rate, income, um, you know, all, all the things that social scientists are interested in. So it does seem as though this thing was very much a, a side project and a bit naive relative to what other, th pe other people in that department and what you know, serious social scientists were, were getting up to at that time. That I, the thread that I found going through it was really interesting because so many of the things they were tackling we're still tackling now in terms of citizen science and, you know, and engagement with science with that group that you know the, how do we ask a question that we think people can give us good data yes. on and how do we make sure their data are good and and even more importantly how we get the results of this back to them these are still live questions for people tackling citizen science now yes. and I find it intriguing that you know we these were the questions they were tangling with then. Mm. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, it's fatal when you do any of this kind of historical research because you, time and again, you see people in the past concerned with exactly the same things. I mean, we, we all think the age we live in is unique and special, but it's so very seldom it, it is. Um, but it may be that you may, you maybe we have to think about this differently. I mean, maybe we have to think that there are certain issues that every generation grapples with, and they never go away. And the interesting question is how, what assumptions are embedded in the way this generation tackled it, as opposed to that one. I mean, the, the, I've mentioned it before, but this whole, whole business of race, it's really startling. Nobody would do that. You know. um, but then we have biological information, you know, genetic information, you know, that we appreciate that the concept of race cannot be grounded in any significant genetic concept. Whereas back then, it was assumed that it, was a, it carried significance in terms of distinct types, real, real difference between types of people, which just, you know, nobody would accept that now. Do you think there was any um, kind of explicit expectation that the scientists who instigated these experiments would go back to the listeners. I mean, you've given a really nice example, and in a way that the Blackbird ones, the yeah. exceptional group, if you like, you know, the, and it's, if you like, it's the first mm. of that series where there's genuine kind of attempt to do it, so it's a kind of, it's a lovely example. Yeah. There doesn't seem to be so much of it going no, through no, those. And that one, bear in mind, it was a year later when yeah. he gave that. Um, so he had to do kind of uh, recap what he'd uh, done. For, you know. uh, but yes, that is the surprising thing, that this was not seen as an integral part of doing the follow-up. Um, it seems so, so crucial. It, it might be that it would have been embarrassing to re reveal the fact that there was so little follow-up on some of these. Um, but no, no I don't, I don't, I don't, that part of the loop seems to have been missed out. Expectation on the scientists' side that it was a model that they couldn't get their heads around. You know, that as far as that, what yeah. they were kind of used to was we'll talk to you, but yes. we're not used to listening, and they simply couldn't get their heads around closing that loop. Yeah, I think that, I think that's a good point. I mean, you talk about citizen science, but there's no doubt in any of this who the scientists are. Yeah. It's not the citizens. No, and then who's asking the questions? Yes. Who's yes. posing the questions quite yeah. clearly? Yeah. The role of the, the, the members of the public as data producers mm. is quite good. I, I must just follow up on John Baker because, because, as I say, he was clearly the star of the show, really. Um, 
Maybe people here have heard, know about John R. Baker. No? Well, he had a spectacular fall from grace. Um, broadcasts of all kinds from this period were published in books and in The Listener, and uh, not just the scientific ones. And you read them, and time and again you think, crikey, this is dull. You know, how did anybody listen to this? But Baker obviously understood the medium, how to make it work, and his talks they sort of leap off the page, and you think, oh yeah, this, this is, he, he is a proper broadcaster. And Mary Adams appreciated this, and that's why she used him again and again, obviously. Um, but after the Second World War, he got increasingly involved in, basically in scientific racism, and um, the, uh, his downfall was a book he published, I think, in, in the 1960s, which, uh, well, you know, it's... It's pretty toxic stuff, really. And that pretty well did for him. And he's now hardly remembered in the field of, well, I think, biology or popularisation of science. And yet, he, I think he's a very significant figure, but we like our significant figures to be virtuous in all respects. Well, there's so much from this period I, I kind of want to look at. I mean, that, that whole project of the changing world is, I think, as much an issue of engagement as the scientific bit. I mean, the science, OK, you can see what art is about. But that whole project of, you know, we're living in a time of crisis and somehow we've got to um, engage with the crisis, engage with our listeners, and if not say what the solution is, just kind of bring them up to speed with how, how si significant, how serious things are. So we'll bring it all under the one umbrella thing. Three, 72 hours continuous broadcasting, you know. And all this organised within a matter of months. Uh, so that when Britain finally dropped out of the gold standard, which I think was uh, September, October 1931, the BBC was actually announcing this whole suite of two terms of the programmes to do with the, the current crisis. Um, that's pretty remarkable. And quite a lot of those talks, you can track down. They're in books, they're in The Listener, they're this, that and the other. And part of one of my long-term projects is to try and do something about that. And I, I kind of think I know what was said in about 60% of, of those 144 broadcasts. Um, and as you were talking about, um, you know, things coming around again, when you, when you look at the economics strand, which is frankly more interesting than the science strand. There are people there saying, the trouble is we have interventionist governments, they don't let markets just... <coughs> and then there are other people <coughs> taking other point of view. Um, so it's, you know, it's all there. It's an extraordinary kind of political intervention. Yes. That changed the world, you know, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, you kind of big picture about talking about how this, you know, it's a serious experiment, if you like, you know. Yeah. In citizens, somewhat we might think of the citizen sites now and the changing world. <clears throat> it's almost like they're kind of pushing the boundaries a bit, do you know what I mean? When we look back yeah. at what is and isn't kind of acceptable for a public sector broadcaster to do. Yes. And, yes. and you've seen kind of more modern examples where the BBC have got itself into so it's like difficult territory between yeah. you know, climate change or yeah. Yeah. Climate, yeah. You know, yeah. that kind of whole idea. Yes. Whether you can or cannot intervene in that mm -hmm. kind of area yeah, is still yeah. a very live issue now. Yeah. It's kind of extraordinary, really, that you see that kind of political crisis, you know. Yes. You yeah. could have done it now, you know, in a period of austerity. So you can imagine the BBC doing an equivalent. Yes, yes. Kind of yeah. set yeah. of suite yeah. of programmes now. Yeah. It's, it just yes. doesn't seem possible now. You know? No, no, it doesn't seem possible. And it became impossible, you know. We shouldn't think this is an enlightened age, because, as I say, by the mid-30s, this kind of project was looking very shaky. Um, so much criticism. Mm. Uh, Reith and others were getting very nervous. So there was a sort of a retreat from this kind of, well, a retreat from various things, a retreat from contentiousness, a retreat from this wholesale adult education thing. And the whole story of adult education over decades is a move from prime time broadcast, in your face, prime time broadcasting, this is important stuff, you need to learn this, to increasingly push to the periphery of the schedules, and that's how the EOU inherited it, you know, adult education at the periphery, mm -hmm. on wavelengths that, like Radio 3 that could 
wasn't going to interfere with too many people and so on. And uh, that's that's what that's how educa adult education has moved in broadcasting from the centre out to the edges. And um, so, you know, so again, there was a, a trend towards more populist material. Um, and also the thing that Reith objected to, which was hiving the serious stuff off into specialist areas so that other people could cheerfully ignore it if they wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but BBC Four, that's no one Okay, well, um, I think we'll just say thanks very much. That was really interesting and, and very illuminating. And thanks ever so much Thank for coming and talking to us. Pleasure, pleasure.